Now, friends, we've come down to verse 8 here in the little epistle of Jude. And I sometimes say chapter 1, but actually there's only one chapter here, so you can say chapter 1, verse 8, or just say verse 8, because there'll not be another verse 8 in the epistle of Jude, that is for sure. Now, he's going to identify for us again these apostate teachers. In verse 4, he told us something about them, that they were ungodly men that had already been written about by the other apostles, and that they were ungodly men. That is, that they left God out of their lives. They turned the grace of our God into wantonness. They went into actually what could be called arrogant sin or arrogant immorality. That is, they flaunted it before the world. Then they also denied the Lord Jesus Christ. That is who he is and what he's done for us. Now we are told something else about them. Here are some other ways to identify them. He says, in like manner also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Now there are four points of identification here that he gives to us. And again, these are the ones that we're to beware of as He puts it back in verse 4. They crept in unawares. That is, they came in sideways. They came in the side door. They slipped into the church. They came in under false colors. Their credentials and their creed were not the same. They pretended to be something that they were not. Now he identifies them further. The word filth, if you notice, is in italics, and it actually is not in the better manuscripts. You can leave it out. We don't need it. They're dreamers. That is, they live in an unreal world, a world that does not exist. My feeling is that the liberal has never dealt really with reality. It's rather romantic. It sounds good on paper. It's nice to be able to solve all your problems by positive thinking. But there's a lot of power in negative thinking also. We need some folk that learn how to say no as well as say yes. And we need to recognize also that these are dreamers in the sense that they will not face up to reality. They do not do it at all. This was something that I took out years ago of the woman's home companion. My wife took it, and I saw this in it, and I clipped it out. And this must have been 15 years ago because it goes back to a group of liberals that have since disappeared from the scene. There's a new crop, however, abroad in the land. I'm going to read this editorially. It says, A pledge... And the pledge is this, to have no part in any war has been taken by a large body of leading Protestant clergymen in the East. Among them are some of the wisest and most influential ministers we have, men such as Fosdick, Holmes, and Sockman in New York City, for example. This covenant of peace group declares that war settles no issues, is futile and suicidal, and is a denial of God and the teachings of Christ. It asserts that the chain of evil which holds us to war can and must be broken now. Now, here's the comment. This is a noble doctrine. However, much events may lead us to differ with it when these bold and sincere men stand in their pulpits and preach this rejection of all war, let us remember that these clergymen by their record have earned the right to their belief in a great democracy. The suppression of the clergy in war and peace can never justly become an instrument of policy as it has under the dictators. Now, they call it a noble doctrine, 
but one that they couldn't agree with. May I say that that was carried over recently in the Vietnam War? It got us in a great deal of difficulty. That type of thinking and these protest meetings that it inspired in this country prolonged the war and actually led to the killing of a great many more American boys that would not have been killed. The very fact that they talked as they did about peace and that type of thing. Now, may I say to you, that is to not realize we live in a big, bad world, and that reality is something that you have to rub your nose into it. It's something that you just can't ignore. Even these steel-belted tires today have to get down and go over the rough places, and some of them go flat, by the way, so that these men are dreamers. They are dealing with that which is not real at all. It's nice for them to say that, as long as we have a big navy and as long as we have atom bomb. It's nice to sit back in the cloister of the church and be able to make brave statements like this. But it just doesn't work out. I have a notion that these same men, if they were around and the new crop that are around, I have a notion that they stay out of the ghetto and the other places at night, although they may talk very bravely in the daytime. I observe that one church that I know of that boasted of how they wanted to work among the minority groups, well, they've closed a the church that was down in a minority group, and I think they made a big mistake in doing it, by the way. Now, these men are dreamers, and for that reason, they have gotten into the church, and they use the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Imagine making the statement here that this is a denial of the teachings of Christ to have war. Well, he made the statement that a strong man armed keepeth his house. That's the way you're going to protect your own, is by being armed. And he also said that a king that's going to war, he's going to sit down and figure out. He didn't say it was wrong to figure out. He said he better figure out. And if he's smart, he will figure out how he's going to carry on that war. May I say to you that it's just a failure to face up to what the Lord Jesus Christ really taught, you see. You and I are living in a world, and he told his disciples when he sent them out one time, to preach, that they were to take nothing with them, not even a pocketbook. Now, when they return and they're to go to the ends of the earth, he says, now, I want to tell you, be sure and take your pocketbook and all your American Express and diner's cards and all your gasoline cards, better take them with you. And also, it might be well to have a sword, now he said. You'll need a sword to protect yourself. May I say to you, what nonsense. These are dreamers that talk like this. It sounds good. This matter of saying, I don't want to have part in war. All of us can say that. That's sort of like mother and apple pie and the flag. We're all for it, you see. It's all great to have no part in war. But we got to face up to reality also. Now, that's a deception, you see, that they bring. And it's nice to preach that to a well-heeled crowd on Sunday morning when there's no war and everything seems peaceable. I know that's really a nice thing to give. Then the second thing about them, they defile the flesh. You notice that they defile the flesh. And that is something to note. That is, they engage in base and abnormal immorality. That is the thing that he has in mind here. Yeah, that is the strange flesh that he was talking about in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. You see that God judged the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And also the angels are a warning because they're going to be judged. They are help for judgment. And God would not let even his own people that he brought out of Egypt enter the promised land because of unbelief, so that 
These are examples to us today, and we better recognize the fact that God will judge this new, not morality, but it's not new immorality either. In fact, there's nothing new about it. It goes back to Sodom and Gomorrah, goes back to the days of Noah. Now, also, it says they despise dominion. That means they reject authority. That is the crowd that wants to get rid of the death penalty. That's the crowd that wants to come up with something that turns everybody loose and you do your thing in your own way. And we're seeing what is taking place. Society is broken out like a cancer in the body politic. We thought we were a civilized people. Why, we are nothing in the world but a group of savages, the way that things are moving. Now, it's because of this matter of despising dominion. That is to reject authority. We want certain laws repealed. We don't want divorce. There's no reason to have these divorce laws. Let's just let them stop living together. And that is something that breaks right across The morality of any nation for the home is the bedrock of any people. And then the fourth thing is, we're told here, and I read it, they speak evil of dignities. Now, that means they disrespect dignities. That is, they protest against rules and those in authority. In other words, they take it out on the police as they represent authority. Or they take it out upon men in high positions, the president and the governors and the mayors. They are made responsible for anything that happens in the nation or the state or the city, regardless of whether they're responsible or not. Why? Because there's been a loss of respect for authority today. Now, I grant you that some of them haven't been worthy of their respect But the office certainly demands respect, and he's going to give an example of that. But now let's notice again these apostates that have come into the church. They came in the side door. They are ungodly. They've turned the grace of God into lasciviousness. They denied the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're dreamers, and they defile the flesh. They despise dominion. They have disrespect for dignities. And that is the thing that characterizes them. And they're dangerous because of the way they come in. For ten long and weary years, the Greeks laid siege to the city of Troy. But they did not make a dent on the fortifications, and they seemed impregnable. They could not make an entrance to the city. And then there came forth a suggestion, and the suggestion was to build a wooden horse and leave it outside the gate, but have some soldiers concealed inside and then pretend to sail away. And so they made the wooden horse, soldiers were put inside, and the wooden horse was put by the gate of the city of Troy. Well, curiosity got the best of them, When they saw the Greeks sailing away, they thought the war was over. Then they went out, saw the horse, decided to pull it inside the city. It was certainly a novelty, something to have. And then that night, the soldiers that were on the inside, why, they climbed out, and they were able to unlock the gates of the city from the inside. And in the meantime, under cover of darkness, the fleet of Greek ships returned, and they had only pretended to sail away. And what an entire army of mighty men could not do from the outside in ten years, a few soldiers did from the inside. And you see, that's the way the church has been harmed today and taken over by liberalism. Actually, the church has never been harmed from the outside. Persecution caused it to grow by leaps and bounds. And today we are witnessing 
the destruction of the church from the inside. It's an inside job. And Christ was betrayed from the inside to the outside. Have you ever noticed that? One of his own betrayed him over to his nation. His nation betrayed him over to the Romans, and the Romans brought him to the cross. That's the way the church is being betrayed today. How? These are the ones that have gotten in. Now, as we've already indicated, what was a little cloud the size of a man's hand is now a raging storm that's lashing across the church, casting up foam and fury today. And we need to hang out this epistle as a storm warning because the apostasy is here in our midst today. Now, I say this not with any great joy or with any feeling of bitterness, but I make it as a statement of fact. All the great denominations of the past are largely gone. They have departed from the faith, probably never to return. They've gone into never-never land. As far as I know, there's no record of a church or an organization or an institution having once departed from the faith ever returning. Now, I'm told there have been some individuals that have. I do not know any of them, but this is a sad thing. Actually, the Wesley movement that began back in England, it was a come-out movement. It was begun when the church became cold and indifferent in that day, and the church of Wesley became a warm incubator to reproduce life. But I'm sorry to say that in many places it's a deep freeze that preserves the outward form of Wesley, but does not have the warmth and the life that was there. Now, other new movements have arisen. And in the past, like great waves, they brought revival into the church. And I'm very frank to say that I do not think fundamentalism as it is today is the answer. I don't feel that it is. I've recently perceived a real weakness which I think will ultimately undermine even fundamentalism. That is simply this. It's been exact and precise in doctrine, but it's been devoid in many cases of ethics and morals. There are no high principles and practices. There's been a moral breakdown outside in contemporary society, but unfortunately it's mirrored in our conservative churches today. I was with a group some time ago, and they used me a great deal, and they're a fine group, but this is an illustration of what I mean. They are insistent and even belligerent about doctrine and separation. And it was called to their attention that one in their midst was guilty of immorality. And actually, they defended him and the ethical practices of another individual in his community. They smelt to high heaven, but he's supposed to be a fundamentalist. May I say to you, they took a whole hum attitude. Unfortunately, today, that has hurt the cause of Christ a great deal because it's come from the inside. Now, we're going to see in this epistle what can believers do in days like this. Now, it may be that there's some that are listening in and saying, Preacher, you're really being sensational, and aren't you exaggerating just a little bit? I don't think I am friends at all. In fact, I'm not sure but what I'm giving this in low key to you today. I'd like to pass on to you a study that was made and statements that have been made by liberal preachers that are right today in pulpits. Out of a poll of 700 preachers recently, the following results were given. 48% denied the complete inspiration of the Bible. 24% rejected the atonement 12% rejected the resurrection of the body. 
and 27% did not believe that Christ will return. A certain minister in Washington, D.C., I'm not sure, but what, he's still there. He says, we liberal clergymen are no longer interested in the fundamental modernist controversy. We do not believe we should even waste our time engaging in it. So far as we are concerned, it makes no difference whether Christ was born of a virgin or not. We don't even bother to form an opinion on the subject. And then over in Arlington, Virginia, that's across the river, there was a minister there. He says, we've closed our minds to such trivial consideration as the question of the resurrection of Christ. If you fundamentalists wish to believe that nonsense, we have no objection, but we have more important things to preach than the presence or absence of an empty tomb 20 centuries ago. And another minister in Washington, D.C. said flatly, in our denomination, what you call the faith of our fathers is approaching total extinction. Of course, a few of the older ministers still cling to the Bible, but among the younger men, the real leaders of our denomination today, I do not know a single one who believes in Christ or any of the things that you classify as fundamentals. Now, my friend, have I exaggerated? Have I overstated the case of whether we're in the apostasy or not? And whether there are certain men that have crept in, 